between government, local government uh, and the FA and that filters down to us for us to kind of disperse out to our, out to our clubs um, and partners as well. Um, so we have to wait and that's a bit of a queue. The FA are in a queue with a number of other organisations to get their guidance approved before it can come out. So no, it can be inconvenient when it drops at five o'clock on a Friday or things change late. Um, so again, just thank you for your patience um, and, for, and for getting the game back up and running this weekend. So we're going to try and rattle through as quickly as we can. So on the call tonight, you've got me, Tom Meesham. I'm the club support officer. So my role is to support all clubs uh, within this county, which is why I'm leading on the meeting. And also I've got Claire with me tonight. So we had Leon last time. We've got Claire tonight, who is our designated safeguarding officer. Um, we're going to look at the return to play and some of the updates to the guidance. We're going to look at, with Claire, some safeguarding compliance, safeguarding future updates, and a real short bit on club development. Um, so we're going to dive straight into the guidance and the return to play. So it was the news that we were all waiting for. We got the green light to um, play this weekend or from Wednesday the 2nd, which was fantastic news. And that was for grassroots um, uh, and non-elite football. So I know some of the non, uh, some of the elite stuff, the Category 1 and 2 academies played through, um, Women's Premier League and obviously the men's professional game, they carried on. But for non-elite and, and the grassroots game, it was good news. Um, Let's get on to that next one. So it's not all new guidance for you. A lot of the guidance has carried on from the last meeting we had um, and from previous guidance that's rolled out. So it wasn't a whole new set of guidance. It was more a case of previous guidance with a bit of an asterisk. So there are some changes. Um, but the key thing for us is that you are um, continuing to use your risk assessments to review and adapt them if they do need to change based on anything that's changed in between last time you played and now. Um, it's also key that you, you're doing those safety notices with your volunteers to ensure that they're fully up to speed with the guidance um, and keeping your volunteers in the loop. And just doing your absolute utmost, if you will, to, to get the game on as safely as we can. Um, so the guidance has remained pretty similar. You've got your COVID officers, which we'll touch on in a minute. In fact, let's touch on that now. Uh, the COVID officers, we, we have had a lot of feedback um, around that, that it, it is a bit of a struggle and, and you do feel like you've got, um, for those of you that are your club's COVID officer, you've got a lot on, on to deal with and, it's, and it is a difficult role. So all the way through this meeting tonight, um, the key message from us is don't suffer in silence and don't try and do it all by yourself. We want the COVID kind of policy of your club to be a full club effort so everyone's got to buy in. Um, so what we're hoping is that the information you get from this meeting, you can disperse to your club committee, to your club officials, and then filter that down to team officials, parents, players, anyone involved in the club. So you can really make that team effort. The last thing we want is a COVID officer to feel like they've got a, um, they've got all the pressure of everything on, on their shoulders. Um, and I know at times it can be quite pressure, pressured when situations are changing and you get late night calls. Um, but it's really important that, that what we do is, is a team effort. Um, so that's crucial. You're going to see this message at the bottom here a lot. Um, we implore everyone to strictly follow the UK government's national COVID-19 restrictions. Any incidents of non-compliance, and this is one of the changes, will be reported to the local county football association. So if people see non-compliance, that is going to come to us. Um, and worst case scenario or, or severest punishment will be that fixtures for the team or the club in question will be cancelled. So that decision will be taken out of the club's hands and you won't play fixtures um, if these things are proven and on a kind of consistent basis. It's not going to be one, one strike and you're out. Um, but that is a key change to kind of where we were before. Where it was a little bit like can, I, can the county FA do anything and so on? So that is one of the key changes. Um, we're going to split this into three areas. First bit's going to be around travel. Second will be around spectators. Third will be about training. Um, I know this one's been a bit contentious. So adults cannot travel in and out of tier three areas to play grassroots football. There are exemptions for in and out of tier three for under 18s, so youth football, disability teams, volunteers and elite players for those travelling for work. Players and essential uh, club staff at steps three to six, 
of the NLS, tiers three to six of the women's football pyramid and the women's pro game and RTCs can travel in and out of tier three areas. Um, so that's the basic guidance around that. For absolute clarity on this, which you may have seen on our statement on Friday, although the surrounding counties for us, and I know some of us are Derbyshire based, Knotts based, West Yorkshire, uh, although we're all in tier three, I'm down in Derbyshire, we're all tier three, I cannot come up to South Yorkshire to play grassroots football. Um, you cannot travel from outside South Yorkshire, for example, to go from Rotherham into Knotts to play at Worksop or Retford. Um, but you can travel within the county. So Sheffield to Doncaster, fine. So you, what we're saying there is you cannot leave or enter the county to, for the reason of playing grassroots football as an adult. And I know that can be frustrating just by our organisation and where, where we're based, that we do have more than most counties, clubs over boundaries. And it can be frustrating when you live 100 yards the wrong side of that and you can't go and play with your friends. Um, the guidance is the guidance, and we've got to stick to that. Um, so I know this is going to lead to players um, missing fixtures and potentially clubs not being able to fulfil any any games for the for the near future in terms of their league fixtures, which is upsetting league programmes. Um, it's the rules and we've got to stick to that. So again, for absolute clarity, it is not permitted to do that um, for adults. So you cannot travel in or out of this county for the reason of playing football. Spectator guidance. And everything I'm talking about tonight is going to be within tier three where we're at at the minute. So in tier three is set out in the government guidance. I'm not going to read the regional LS bit every time. Outdoor grassroots football also remain permitted to accommodate socially distant spectators, but must follow the rule of six and government guidance on restriction within certain tiers. So what does this mean? Outdoors, people cannot mix with other people from uh, outside their household or support bubble in a private garden or most public outdoor venues. However, people can meet in groups of up to six in public outdoor spaces, including outdoor sports grounds and facilities. The key part of this is that when you are mixing or when spectators are mixing with people outside of their household bubble, they must be socially distanced. Now, I've tried to get clarity on this earlier today. Within a sports ground setting, I believe it's a two metre socially distance, not one metre plus that you might expect or you've heard on the news for different situations. But in the sports ground setting, they're looking at two metres. Um, I'm happy to be proven wrong on that, but that's what I've read and seen around the guidance. So we're sticking with that for the time being. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide to try and give you a bit of a picture of what this means. So essentially, this is a, this is a side of a pitch with a corner flag, if you couldn't work my diagram out. Um, essentially, what it should look like at the side of a pitch when spectators are attending. The only groups that you should see should be household bubbles. So, for example, uh, parent and child or parent and siblings have written there, or it might be mum and dad. They can stand together. Within or different to that, you may have groups of six. So you may have a uh, dad and brother of a child that's playing or an adult that's playing, and also the player's best friend have come as a kind of uh, supporters to watch their friend or, or uh, relative. They can stand around each other, but the household bubble, the parent and sibling, can stand next to each other. The friend has to be socially distanced from that household bubble. So in short, although we're saying groups of six, if they're not in the same household, then they need to be socially distanced. So in short, it's just a social distancing, distancing measure for anyone not from a bubble. Um, so again, that's a difficult one to police. Um, we're highly recommending, we can't enforce, we're highly recommending um, that within youth football, that we only allow one parent or clubs try to promote only one parent attending um, per child, per fixture, um, just to try and reduce the number of people um, at fixtures. Um, I was out and about yesterday and I saw a lot of fixtures going on at some kind of big sites and it was really pleasing to see um, the parents or the spectators scattered around the pitch, nicely distanced. Um, so um, it's, it's crucial that we're trying to adhere to that. Just want to touch on private venues because the question was asked. Um, 
private venues are within their right to have a have like a carpet ban on no spectators to come and watch football on their site. It's their site at the end of the day, um, and they can do that. That is a club and facility matter to to work out. Um, so we can't lean on a facility and ask them. So no, you, you can't do that. You need to let spectators in. If they deem it to be unsafe at their site, it's unsafe, and they're not go They don't have to change that. What I would recommend if you do come up against that problem is to just reiterate to the facility the work that you're doing behind the scenes. So your risk assessments, your COVID officers, uh, and, and how you've communicated the guidance to your parents, players, spectators, anything like that, to demonstrate that you're not just rocking up and it's going to be a free for all, that there is a bit of method to what you're doing and that you do have the right things in place. That may open up the opportunity to then have spectators. Um, so to be clear, if a facility declare it unsafe, the fixture has to go ahead um, without spectators. At no point are we suggesting that fixtures should be parent free. I know that's been banded about and some people were a little bit confused. That is not a recommendation from the FA or the county FA to make fixtures parent free in youth football. It does open up a bit of a problem for, for kind of first aid and stuff where ideally you'd want the parents to be if they can. Uh, doing the treatment rather than requiring the coaches. So it is certainly not a requirement to have parent-free youth um, fixtures. Just want to double check, I've covered everything on there. So although I've done the diagram like that, um, essentially household bubbles can stand together. Um, and if they're not, they need to be socially distanced. So we cannot, I've told you to see this a bit, we cannot stress enough the critical importance of all involved in the game and doing their level best to allow the grassroots game to continue. The key guidance remains as follows. So your social distancing, hygiene standards, QR codes, and minimising spectators at youth games where possible. Um, this one's going to be a bit, I don't want to sound brutal on this one. Prior to lockdown two, we were extremely close to having a blanket ban on football in some of our local areas. Now, that wouldn't have been a county FA decision. That would have been local government. Um, we've got to try and work together, uh, county FA, clubs, leagues, parents, players, to, to make sure we don't end up in that situation. I don't know if anyone's followed um, what's been going on in Lancashire at the minute, but they have sadly had to put blanket bans on football in some of their council districts. And that is till the end of January. And that's the real life. That's what can happen if we don't stay on top of this. Um, so it's not a threat. And what I'm hoping is that this is more a case of I'm trying to arm you almost with the ammunition to really preach this to the people that are attending your fixtures, to your players, to your coaches and so on. That It's really, really serious that we are sticking to the guidance and guidelines. So. A common problem that we are running into is people saying, what can I do about um, the spectators not adhering or standing together when I know that they're not a household bubble? Um, so we, we're trying to arm you with almost that threat that it, it is that serious. It will just be a blanket ban on football and we'll lose the right to play. Uh, and that will be taken out of our hands and your hands. Um, so it's really important that we are pushing that message to our clubs, uh, to our clubs, to our spectators, to our parents, to our players. Um, we do have situations where local councils are out checking compliance. So they are out and about having a look at what's happening. And if they see repeated offences, we could end up at that stage where the game or the club um, cannot play football. So we've got to really push and work hard as a team to do that. And I appreciate it, it is tough. You're not the police, um, and it can be difficult when you know these people, they're long-term friends, or they might be relatives, or you've known these people for years, to say, hold on a minute, can you can you get your distance a little bit further? Can you move further away from the pitch, and so on? Um, my recommendation for you as clubs is to just try and preempt this as much as you can. Um, so how we get in the message out there um, to our parents, to our players, to our spectators, to our coaches. So for me, if we can work um, to have a consistent stream of messaging um, around the guidance to keep feeding that to people so that it's constantly, not in the face, but it's there, it's a reminder, um, 
to ensure that there's no excuse for them not knowing that. So hopefully then if you do need to speak to people, it's a reminder and it's not a threat. Um, we do have some visuals. I think every single person associated with a football club may have received this at the weekend. Um, the link's there too. Um, and the FA have produced a lot of visuals that you can either send out via email, you can put on your social media, um, and also you can put at your venues as well uh, as another form of getting the information dispersed to the people who need to see it. Finally, just one more recommendation on that is, is that you try, if, if you've got the confidence to do it, and not everyone will, for almost a pre-game briefing, and I know they're not always at your venue and it might just be a, a field with one pitch on. If the manager or one of the coaching staff needs to take a lead, just to remind spectators of their responsibilities. Again, it's not a threat. You're not going to say, if you don't do it, we're going to kick you out. But just that message that we're all in this together. Football's at real risk of being cancelled. If we don't do this, please, can you try to maintain your distances um, throughout your attendance at any of our fixtures at do it before the game if it needs to be a gentle reminder at half time. Um, and I think that constant stream of messages is the best way to go about it. As I said, you are not the police. You can't go around uh, saying we'll cancel the game or we're gonna or we're gonna drag you off the side. It, it's not like that. So all you can do is your absolute best. But I think a constant stream of clear messaging is probably the way to go. Um, I know Tony's just popped a message in there. Oh, players. Well, that, oh, no, that's a different one. Can we expect spectators on all sides of the pitch? I'd, I'd rec it depended on the venue, but I'd recommend it as long as obviously they can be distanced from the pitch safely. Um, I know we do use respect banners at youth football and they're normally down one side. I wouldn't recommend having spectators down the same side as the players and the coaching staff. Keep that area uh, separate for them. But if you need to go around the corners of the pitch, um, I don't see that being a problem. And I see that as a common sense approach. Um, so personally, don't have a problem with that. And I just think you're just showing a bit of common sense there. So I've got no, no problem with that at all. Um, if the previous slide wasn't kind of a, a real warning, it was more a case of that's what could happen. This one is a warning um, to everyone. As well as the, uh, as well as spectator, coach, and player adherence to the government guidelines, we've had a huge, huge problem, and I, I'm not going to hide it. It's been really frustrating um, with clubs posting social media, including the following: use of changing rooms where the full squad are in there, teams celebrating in the changing rooms after matches, or they've got the boombox on and they're singing along. I know we had some cup finals to to tidy up. There was Pete, there was social media with clubs. Spraying beer around with 20, 25 people in the changing room. We've seen photos of pre-match squad photos where it's arm around each other standing in the goal. We've seen pre-match huddles being snapped saying team are ready to go out. Um, we've seen it's nice to be back photos arm around someone. Look, John and John and Steve are back. It's nice to be back. It's not a case of don't post them. Don't do it. Full stop. Because they're the they're the quick losses that it's really easy for the people that are above us in terms of governance and guidance. Um, if they see things like that, it's an easy win for them to point and say, look, football are not adhering to the guidance. Um, so it's really, really important that, that that ceases. And if we see it now, we're going to be contacting you directly and it, it will be almost that yellow card. If we see this again, it, that then could lead to fixtures being suspended. So if the, if the slide before wasn't us warning you, this one is, it's really important that we're not, um, we're tripping ourselves up with this one. So it's just really important that we don't let a standard slip on stuff like that. Um, I know it's nice to have the social media to celebrate being back, but photos of the warm up, fine, because that's part of the game. Um, photos of the game itself, fine with that, but we shouldn't be arranging for people to stand with each other. I've seen a few socially distanced photos where they are two metres apart, that's fine, um, but things like using the change room, it, it, it's just not acceptable to have 10, 15, 20 people in the change room. You need to stick to the risk assessment that's in place for that um, and really minimise the amount of people in there. If there's other people in there, those people should be wearing masks. Um, so that's, that's a real hard line on that and we can't keep tripping ourselves up on that. Um, so next slide. Okay, training guidance for tier three. 
this question is a really fair question and it popped up a few times. So the FA advised that we should have minimum contact whilst training, but we can play competitive games at the weekends. How does that work? Um, and it's a little bit like the, the common one that you hear that COVID stops at nine o'clock when the pubs close or whatever, or start, sorry, when the pubs close at nine o'clock. It, it, it does sound a bit strange. So I'm just going to read you through the guidance and I'm going to just try and give you some context as, as to why this is really important for us as, as clubs. So uh, the guidance, all participants should minimise contact and training where possible, minimise tackles, drills or practices that require close contact, all protocols on social distancing, hand sanitising, equipment sharing, facilities, test and trace must be adhered to. So that is the tier three guidance. Our aim has to be to reduce the risk of transmission. Um, so we've got to keep that in, in the back of our minds at all times. So hopefully I can give you some context as to why we do need to view training slightly differently. Um, and this goes across the board from youth to adult. So we're aiming to reduce the trans risk of transmission. Training uh, is essentially practice. So we give players the opportunity to have loads of attempts uh, and loads of practices at certain topics within the game, whether you're at the top end or at the bottom end of football, it's under fives. We manipulate training to, to get out outcomes. So we force outcomes and it rarely consists of just playing in your format. So if you're 11 v 11, rarely will your training consist of you playing 11 v 11 on 11 v 11 pitch. So practices are regularly smaller sided, 2 v 2, 3 v 3. They're regularly in tighter spaces because you've only got a quarter or a third of the 3G. Um, and it increases the number of attempts, challenges and contacts that, that players are having. Um, so for context on that, the table here is just a bit of research on, on football. And if you just compare the amount of touches that a, an average player would have in an 11 v 11 60 minute game, 22 touches, compare that to what would happen or the average, sorry, if a player was playing 4v4 on a smaller pitch. It's, it's 11 times as many contacts. And for every contact player A has, there'll be player B, C and D either applying pressure to them or receiving a pass or competing with them. So it just demonstrates that training isn't the same. The tighter spaces and the reduced numbers that we use are gonna create more risk of transmission. No matter what we do or say, that's the case. Um, so that is why training and matches aren't the same. They shouldn't be viewed as the same. Um, and on the next slide, I'm hopeful we'll be able to give you some uh, kind of ways to reduce the risk within those sessions. So the table on here uh, and the bit to the side is, is actually a Premier League document. I don't know why this isn't an FA document, but it's, it, it's a Premier League document. So to reduce the risk, because we've, we've already covered that there is a high risk at training, unfortunately, just due to the nature of it. To reduce the risk, we have to consider the COVID load. I know that sounds a bit of a sweeping statement, but essentially the COVID load is, is how risky is a practice? How risky is that tonight's training session on a COVID risk assessment? And essentially, we want our coaches to spend less time in practices with low player area size. Now, player area size is just how much space player A has got within the practice. Um, so essentially, a big practice with lower numbers, the player has more area size for themselves and therefore the risk is reduced. Now, if you put 20 players in a 10 by 10, obviously, that I think, if my maths is correct, they'd have 0.5 meters squared each to themselves. So that is obviously high risk. So we've got to encourage our coaches to plan, which isn't always that easy when they've got a full-time job, or just to consider that they need to try and reduce the amount of time they spend in practices that are in tight spaces with higher numbers. Um, so avoid it at all costs if we can. Let's try and encourage our coaches to use individual and technical practices. And know that can be dull and know that can be boring, but if they can pad out a session of an hour with 20 minutes of individual work or unopposed work, the players are still getting some returns, but also you've really reduced the risk of transmission for that 20 minutes, which means then when you go into something opposed or into your game at the end, the risk has been mitigated. You've kind of balanced it off a little bit, so you have reduced the risk. Um, so it's something that we've really got 
to try and push and support our coaches just to understand. It's for you as, as club officials as well. If you are out and about, just checking on the standards in terms of COVID guidance and stuff at your training sites. If you do see sessions where they're packed in like sardines or they're standing in queues and they're standing really close to each other or they're bringing them in for a team talk and really they should be keeping them on the pitch to do it, you do need to just speak to the coaches and just reiterate that it's crucial that they're doing everything they can to reduce the risk uh, of transmission at training. Um, what I will do after this, you will get the whole presentation, but I will cut down these two slides. Um, I'll also make a note of the time that this is recorded on. Um, so you can send that and disperse that to all your coaches. I've got no problem with you sharing that. And you can share a link to the video for a little bit of the meat of the bone, meat on the bone around what we've just talked about. But I just really want to round that off is training isn't the same as matches. There will always be more contacts and therefore more risk of transmission. Coaches, managers have got to do their bit in reducing the risk. So we don't want small player area size. We want larger areas where possible. If it's a small area, reduce the number of players playing within that area. That is so, so crucial for us to keep the environment safe. Okay, we'll move it on. So we're all in this one together. Um, we're really keen to keep the game safe. And I know we mentioned earlier um, about how we disperse information to everyone associated with the club. That poster on the left-hand side there is, is readily available on our website for everyone. We think that's a great tool for young people just to demonstrate that even though they're young, they've still got their own responsibilities and they can play their part too in keeping themselves, their friends uh, and their families safe. So you can go and steal that off our website. We've got it as a, as a photo and as a PDF. So that can go on your website, that can go on your Twitter, that can go out in WhatsApp chats. It can, you can disperse it however you want. It's totally free of charge uh, and for their you to use um so the key message was on this is just that we really want you to try and disperse these these messages as much as you can out to your partners your adults uh, your parents spectators coaches uh, and kids um, and just doing that through your multiple platforms emails whatsapp groups parent whatsapp groups your website like we said that constant stream of, of correct information is, is one way that we really think we can have a positive kind of effect on ensuring the guidance is followed. Um, for all the stuff that's on the page now, so if anyone's still unsure around when to self-isolate, school bubbles uh, and school closures, um, how to manage situations around we're looking like we've got low numbers for the weekend or we're a player down this weekend, um, qualifications, chart standing QR codes, we covered that on the last meeting um, in depth, so I don't want to retouch on that. If you are still unsure of any any issues around that, there will be a QA and a at the end, but I will send out the link to the last meeting as well so you can rewatch and pick up any guidance that you need from there. So we're not going to retouch on to that. Hopefully we've covered the kind of three key areas um, around the guidance. Um, but like we said, do the absolute best that you can. We don't want the COVID officers in particular, but you as club officials to feel like you're on your own. If you're ever unsure, if you're ever stuck, you can pick up the phone and contact us. Our numbers are all based on the website. We're all working from home, so we're on our mobile, so we should be easily available. Um, and if you want to email us, we can receive them too and get back to you as quickly as we can. So please don't, we don't want anyone struggling in silence. Please do come to us um, with any concerns or anything that you're unsure of. What I'm going to do now is I'll pass over to Claire um, and Claire's going to touch on a few safeguarding bits. I'm going to scroll through the messages and just see if I've missed anything whilst Claire is doing that. So over to Claire. Thank you, Thank Tom. You, Tom. Um, oh, hang on. I've got oh, feedback on. Back again. Back Can again. you just mute your mic? I'm sorry. I was... Thank you. Right. The message that I really want to get across in line with what Tom's saying about how important it is to uh, to stay safe and to focus on COVID is that we also need to make sure that we're not forgetting about the importance of safeguarding. Everybody's you know, rushing to, well, having a look at their risk assessments, trying to sort out and organise all of the different aspects that need to come into the club for COVID. But safeguarding has to underpin everything that we do still in order to make sure that children and people are at risk are safe. 
at this time, this is when if somebody wanted to access children, they could use this time where it's a bit confusing, maybe where people aren't quite focusing on safeguarding in the same way in order to get into a club, to build those relationships and to slip past some of the compliance that's in place in order to, uh, to keep children safe. So just make sure that we're still looking out for safeguarding, talking about safeguarding, make sure that it's on your club agenda with your club members at all times. Remember, it's that message always there. Safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. Tom, could you just shift me forward, please? Tom. Yeah, so it's only a couple of slides that I wanted to say tonight because this meeting is about COVID. But in order to be able to make sure that this message is still getting across, I felt it was important. I know there's a lot of club welfare officers on here tonight and you are the people who are trying to make sure that you've got everything in place. So we have to have this compliance. There is a problem at the moment with compliance. During the November lockdown, we were unable to do DBS verification. So there has been a lag with that, but there was some issues previously to that as well after affiliation. I've been in contact with some clubs, people are working to try and get it sorted out. But you need to, as a club welfare officer or as a club secretary, check your qualifications from your club at all times, follow up on those issues. I have had contact from a couple of people recently where there's been people who've not wanted to do the qualifications, people who've said, I don't see why I need a DBS or why I need to do the safeguarding qualification. They need to do it because the FA say that it's absolutely mandatory for them to do it. They need to do it because it's the only way we can be sure that children are safe and that clubs are managing their safeguarding appropriately. So if you are having an issue, if you do have somebody that is refusing to do it or just won't get in touch or doesn't go onto their whole game system in order to submit their application or doesn't pay for it, then get in touch with me. We'll work on it together. At the same time, some, some of the integration between whole game system and um, DBS has created some problems. If you're experiencing those problems, get in touch with me. We'll figure out what the problem is and sort out a way that we can make sure that that compliance is in place. Um, there are some clubs who have had new welfare officers come into place over this time where there's not been face to face training. Uh, the FA allowed us to add people under a county action plan, which meant that we would be able to catch up with them at a later date. The good news is that the welfare officer workshop virtual workshop is up and running and there is loads and loads of dates that are available for this now. So anybody who doesn't have that, any club welfare officer who doesn't have that welfare officer training, they should have had contact from FA Education already. But if they haven't, you can get in touch with me or go to the safeguarding boot room, uh, safe, uh, FA boot room safeguarding courses to sign up for the welfare officer virtual course. You do need to have done the recertification in order to do the welfare officer course. If you've never done any safeguarding training, so you've not got the safeguarding children workshop, the FA have opened up the recertification only for club welfare officers that are under a county action plan to do that as a standalone online course until such times as we get the Safeguarding Children workshop back as a virtual thing. So if you need to do the recertification, you can get in touch with me or you can get in touch with education at the fa.com and they'll make sure that that recertification is opened up for you and then you can get onto the welfare officer course. When it comes to compliance, it is an incredibly important thing. We all understand that. We all know that it is important. But if people aren't trying to move these issues forward and get themselves compliant, then those teams will be suspended. If I've been in touch with you, contacted you about non-compliance and given you an action plan, said you've got until this date to get that sorted out and there is no move forward, then I will be getting in touch with the league to say this team is suspended because of safeguarding reasons uh, and you won't be able to play fixtures until such times as you've managed to sort it out. This is about people that aren't trying as opposed to people that are trying but uh, uh, are, are re uh, finding barriers. Uh, we want to work with you, we don't want to catch you out, we want to work with you but you sometimes need to do some of that work yourself. Tom? Right, so the last one for me is that uh, in, after Christmas in January you want to be able to have a, a meeting like this but just for club welfare officers and talk about some of these specific issues. So child's voice and how we can do some engagement and listening to young people. Uh, getting a complaints procedure in place. Some clubs have got some really good complaints procedures. Some people haven't got them and would really like to get those uh, sorted out. 
and then also a look at the desktop review uh, which we're doing instead of safeguarding validation meetings. So I'll put out another date uh, at the beginning of January for a meeting such as this and I'll look forward to welcoming you all to that as well. Thanks Tom. You're muted Tom. There we go. Right. Uh, so quick bit from me because we can't do the, the exciting bit that I wanted to plan because it won't allow us to do it today. Um, but just a heads up, we have, well, we're in the process of revamping our club development page. The website broke a bit today, so it's not actually gone up live. Um, and that's just to complement our More Than A Club magazine, which looks at club development matters within the county. So you may have seen that we, we uh, bring that magazine out monthly when we're not on furlough. Um, and we try and showcase best practice from, from clubs such as yourselves. Um, to try and share the knowledge within the county for everyone's benefit. So the development page is, is just about to relaunch. Um, and basically the aim of it is to just support you as clubs in your development, to uh, help with your growth, sustainability, and the consistency of the offer and uh, the standards behind the scenes for clubs. Um, we want all of you to be as sustainable as possible, particularly during these times. Um, the page is going to be flexible. We want it to kind of grow and adapt in line with what you you as clubs need. Um, so this is where there's going to be a little questionnaire that you could just fill in really quickly that's not working. So I'd really recommend um, if there are areas of club development where you are struggling or you think we're not doing as well as we could or we're spending an awful lot of time in this particular area, send me a message. Uh, and I'll either arrange a meeting with yourself or we might have templates or we might have support structures already there um, that we can um, that we can then get out to you. Um, so when it does finally fix itself, the website on the new club development page, we've got four new sections. One is around annual accounts, um, committee meetings, annual general meetings uh, and codes of conduct. So all of those areas have got some best practice. And they've got templates that you can basically steal uh, and use yourselves. Um, so we've got two sets of accounts on there, real simple one for our one team clubs um, and then a larger one um, for clubs above one team, essentially. Um, we've also got committee meetings and, and general meetings. It's some feedback we've had and it's also um, from the work we've done around chart standard, an area that we think clubs need uh, a little bit of support with to ensure they're getting consistency to ensure that the, the right things are getting discussed. And really important with that is that uh, clubs are being transparent with their members and ensuring that the things that are discussed are finding their way to the right people so that people can understand how the club's being run, what decisions are being made, who are the people in charge. Um, so that's on there too. Uh, and then just some general stuff around codes of conducts, um, which I would assume nearly all of us on this call of chart standard know all about, but it's up there and there's some best practice about how to use code of conduct, not just the actual documents, but best ways to use them. So that will be up and running soon. And like I said, if there's any areas you think you're struggling with or you think we spend too much time on our accounts or we spend too much time on subscriptions, whatever it is, get in touch with me and we, we might already have some things in place. And also on the flip of that, if you're great at something, let me know because I don't have time in Fortric to run my own football club as well. So... I know that people out there are doing things that are much better than than I can do and also with experience understand what it's about for clubs. If you're doing something great, I want to hear about it. Two reasons. We can kind of tie up what you're doing and disperse that to club. But also we can do a little piece on the club as well and really demonstrate what you're doing to try and share the message. So it's just a final reminder. If you as a club are doing something great, if you did a great fundraising mission, if you a military on your account, if you've developed your facility, you've improved your grass pitches or whatever it is, I want to hear about it so I can disperse kind of your story out to everyone else. So that's really key. Um, so that page, hopefully, if the website fix itself, will be up tomorrow. Um, I'll speak to Molly first thing and just see where we're at with that. So on to everyone's favourite bit. Um, before we start uh, letting people put their hands up, We've tried to give you the real key bits um, from the latest kind of return to play. Like I said, some of the more the stuff that hasn't changed is in the last presentation we did. And there is a video that I will send out to everyone. Um, more than happy to ask questions. I know there's one thing I didn't mention in there and I made a note. Indoor football in tier three, not permitted for adults. There is the exemption for disability adult football and junior football. Um, so if anyone was going to ask that one, I've hopefully ticked that one off for you. So that includes futsal and it includes training indoors too. Um, so 
Um, I'll just invite anyone that does have a question to pop their hand up and then we can just call on you, you can unmute yourself. If you don't want to speak in the group, pop it in uh, the chat and me and Claire will do our best to answer it. Your disclaimer is, me and Claire don't always have the time to read every single part of the guidance. So if we can't answer your question now, we'll take a note and we will get back to you uh, first thing tomorrow. I've seen the tuck shop one come up. I think Claire's answered that one for us. So we don't need to touch on that one again, but that did come up a lot in the uh, questions asked. So we've got a hand up. How do I view who it is? Because all I can see is a hundred. It's Adam Harrison. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you for that. I know you, I know you've just said that you touched on the tuck shop um, yeah. within the comments, but I haven't got the function for okay. the comment section. So if you can just relay that back to us and T stores as well, if you can. OK, so Claire, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've, I've pretty much written down what we went with the blanket answer last time. So uh, in tier three, takeaways essentially allowed. So you notice that the takeaways are still open and so on. So takeaway is allowed. So tuck shops are allowed. It needs to be included in your risk assessment. And I can't believe a man to say this, but within your risk assessment, you need to include how the litter is going to be dealt with. So you need to include that you're going to have trash cans available because you volunteers do not need to be handling people's litter as that is obviously putting them at risk. So cover it within your risk assessment and explain how you're going to do that safely. I don't know how you run your tuck shops currently. I'm just thinking back to when I was at primary school and it was normal back when I was there, it was there was a 10p. 10p bag, a 20p bag, a 50p bag. So if you pre-pack them and then it's a case of people can pick them and take them rather than you popping sweets in. I guess you use tongs and stuff. I'm not I'm not really attuned to the, the tuck shop world, but you need to be doing everything you can to keep that safe. It needs to be included in your risk assessment. In terms of sites with on-site catering, we can't really answer that. And you'll need to look at the government's hospitality guidance. We're in tier three, so it'll only be takeaway only. And, but you need to be adhering to all the guidance around that rather than any football specific guidance. Does that answer your question, Adam? Yeah, it does. Yeah, thank you for that. And it does talk. sound trivial sometimes, but that, that's a key money maker for, the, for you as clubs. And we, we wanted to get a, a clean answer for you on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, how do I view again? Oh, Elaine, do you want to unmute yourself? Elaine, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Do you want to get yourself off mute? Oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, Bye. sorry. Um, did you say you'll be sending the slides out? Because I didn't get to see any of them still. OK, yeah, I'll be sending the slides out and I'll send a link to the video as well. Um, so you'll get all the slides you've had tonight. And like I said, I'll separate the coaching ones into a separate one too. So if you want to direct that straight out to your coaching workforce, you can feel free to do that. That's great. Thank you. No problem. There's another hand, but I can't see the person who it is. How do I view this? Is it on that? No. It should be on the participants. We've got four. Oh, hands. there it is. There it is. There it is. Yeah. There with me. There with me. It's firing up slowly. Um, Stacy Oliver, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, yeah, mine was just around the uh, manual sign-in book because it's not something that we've done um, before. It wasn't a mandatory in the previous um, guidance. So it, obviously your advisors now to, if we can't have, it, we'll obviously have the QR code, but also have a manual sign-in book available for those that don't have access to the app. My only issue around that is that we don't have the luxury of volunteers being able to be with that sign-in in book to get somebody to fill that in when they come onto the field. And um, so it means us having to leave that there, which then for me, it, in terms of maintaining security of someone's information in line with GDPR, I just don't feel comfortable with doing that. Claire, have you got, have you got a response on that one? Um, yeah, I think, though, although it wasn't mandatory uh, to have a signing in book, it actually had been included in guidance previously around having some form of manual sign in. However, we've always looked at that as being, particularly within the youth game, um, there's an, uh, uh, there's a, a team list for you know your team and then there'll be a team sheet for the opposing team so if there was a need for a test and trace due to a positive um covid result 
then actually the other club would have the list of the players that were there and you would have the list of your players. And as a consequence, you should be able to find out which spectators were also with them. So in some ways, there always is a manual record, right. although it's not as strong as if it was actually writing it down in a book. OK, that's great. Thanks. OK, perfect. Uh, Got something in chat, Tom, that I just want to say before I forget about it. Um, apparently it says in the guidance that clubs need to take the temperatures of players, but I've not actually come across this bit. I've Have you not come across that anywhere. I know that... I saw that. I've got my answer here. As far as we're aware, that is that isn't a requirement. Players and parents of players are required to self-assess. Uh, they're required to self-assess before they come and attend a football match. Um, so that is obviously against the signs and symptoms, which is high temperature, uh, continuous cough, etc. Um, there is no requirement to, and I know some clubs have purchased the guns. And don't get me wrong, it's great practice. And I'm not going to say I recommend it because some clubs might not have the cash to go and do that. That's fine. But it's something that, that you can do because it does give you a quick answer. Um, I know within my coaching environment, we use them and players do get sent home off the back of the gun. If it's above the uh, above 37.9, I think it is on the guns. If it goes above that, they're not able to train. Um, so it's it's something that you can do. It's not a requirement. The, the requirement is that people self-assess themselves and children are self-assessed by their parents before they attend training and matches. Hopefully that's answered that. Oh, I, I've certainly not seen it in the guidance anywhere as a change. Um, Kay, do you want to unmute yourself? Hello. Hi, Kay. Hi. Um, right, regards um, that we've come back to football after we've had a four week um, sort of on time. Um, how do we go about getting parents to re consent if they feel that the risk is still too high? And how do we go about reassuring them parents that it's deemed to be safe again after we've had like four weeks where we've, it's not been safe to play? Um, and how do we go against the league if if we've got not a full team? Okay. Um, regards to playing. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let Claire. Can you answer the first bit? And I'm going to try and tie. Hopefully, tie up the end bit. Ah, uh, do you know what? I was just looking at the chat, so I kind of missed the first bit. Kay, I'm so sorry. I feel desperately rude. But could you just repeat um, that? So we've had four weeks off. Um, it's of grassroots. Um, it's actually the junior teams we've got quite a few anxious parents that have not wanted to consent for them to come back at this moment in time how do we go um how do we move forward with the parents that have still got anxieties do they have to consent are they allowed to take some weeks off and then decide that they feel that it's safer without a penalty from league office and and not playing the games and and such things i suppose um my initial thought would be around the parents' anxieties, that the, the best way of trying to alleviate those anxieties is to explain um, the, explain where the risks are in football and explain what the club is doing and the risk assessment process. Um, but if parents decide that they don't want to allow their children to play at the moment, then it is their right to do that. There's obviously, you know, I'm sure um, you're not suggesting for a minute that you'd force them to play. No. When it comes to the league sanctions, that bit I'm not sure about. Uh, that's the bit I'm hoping to I was hopefully going to come in, but I just wanted you to answer the question around consent and, and so on. Um, right. And this is a tricky one to answer. And I know I, I've been getting clubs in touch with me recently, just concerned about... Um, parents removing consent closer to Christmas because they don't want their child which could potentially ruin Christmas when you've actually got an opportunity to spend it with with people outside of your household um, right. in terms of the league what you, I'm going to give you some recommendations not every league is the same uh, it will always be based around the league rules we cannot enforce a league to we can't say change that rule we, do, we cannot do that any league rules would need to be changed uh via a uh, special general meeting or at the agm so these are going to be recommendations for us but i can't guarantee that your league will um do it as you want if that makes sense so 
if you lose a number of players due to um, not having the consent has been removed and that leaves you under the threshold of what you need to play a fixture, and this is the key bit, if, if you've got nine players, for example, and you're playing 11 v 11, the league, you will have to play the fixture. The league will not postpone that fixture. Um, we talked on the last meet around how to try and make the best of that bad situation in terms of contacting the opposition and just letting them know what the, what the deal is and they might be willing to drop down and match your numbers or they might be willing to drop down if they go into a 3-0 lead or whatever that may look like. Um, if you have the numbers to play, the league are going to enforce you in most cases. Um, should you fall below the threshold... So, I don't know, if you had 15 in your squad and 10 of your players, um, parents re removed their consent to play, you would obviously need to contact the league. I can't tell you what they would do. It could be a case that they postpone your fixtures um, indefinitely until you're in a position to play. It might be that they, they may not choose to accept that as, uh, as a... That's the wrong phrase. They may charge you with non-fulfillments, so non-fulfillment of fixtures. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to be fined uh, and have the fixtures um, awarded to the opposition. It means you've been charged and they're seeking the rationale and the reasoning behind that. Um, so you would then have to put your mitigation in that we've lost 10 of our players due to consent being removed. They may want to see evidence around that, so you might have to share some of the uh if there's email conversations, just to say, I, I, uh, if it's from parents saying, I am removing my child's consent to play because I don't feel it's safe. They may seek some evidence around that. I'm not saying you have to provide it, but they may seek stuff like that. So you may be charged by the league for non-fulfillments of any fixtures that you miss. Um, and it would be on to you then to uh, plead. So you'll be given the choices from the charge from the league, guilty. Uh, not guilty and want a hearing and then you can do your mitigation around that um, so it'd be important to state we've lost 10 players due to um, due to their parents removing consent um, it is tricky and I know that um, I've seen a few hands go up since we started talking about this and that clubs have been charged when they think that they're um, that they're trying to do the right thing um, so whether it's self-isolating whether it's a school bubble closure and so on. Um, the important thing to uh, the important thing to do is if you are charged for any reason from the league for anything around non fulfilment, that you respond to the charge. We've had some situations where clubs uh, they've been left frustrated that they've been charged and they've they failed to uh, respond to the charge and that's caused them a problem down the line. So if you if you do have to have games called off or if that situation you've mentioned crops up and you get charged it's important to to respond to the charge and you can put we're not guilty and these are the reasons why and then that case can be played out um, i'm not saying whether you'd be found proven or unproven um but you need to follow that process um rob water who is our senior administrator has asked me to say if at any point you're unsure or you're not sure why you've been charged or you're a little bit concerned or confused you can contact him and he will try to advise um, around the rules of why you've been charged because a lot of the, in fact, I'm going to say 100% of the time, the legal within that, they will be correct to charge you. It's not necessarily going to guarantee that you are found guilty. The charge is almost a fact-finding mission. You've not played your fixture this weekend, therefore you've been charged and we need to know what the circumstances are around that. So it's not a guarantee that the fixture will be handed to the opposition. It's not a guarantee that you'll be found guilty. So it is, it is important to follow the process through. Um, and if you are charged and found guilty and you still believe that you did the right thing, you can appeal that charge and then it will come through to County FA to review. And, and again, I'm not saying that that's not going to turn over the guilty, not guilty, but it, it can, um, it can. And I'm channeling Rob here. It will, Rob will be able to pass comment, or the the appeal will be heard on the severity of the punishment. Um, so if the, if there's been a, a large fine or something like that, so that is the process. But just to reiterate, it's crucial that you follow the disciplinary process if you are charged. It's not. A guilty sentence from the minute you receive the charge 
it is you've not played a game, therefore you've been charged, and this is your opportunity to provide us the information of why that fixture wasn't fulfilled. Um, I've gone really off on a tangent there, Kay. Um, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, right, but yeah. That one around consent is a tricky one, and it's the same if you get a late, late. We had a situation the other week with a late, late um, call on a player tested positive, and it was all action stations, and the club weren't sure what they should be doing, uh, and they were charged. But in when you work back through the timeline, they probably did the right thing. So they still received the charge for not fulfilling the fixture, which is the correct process. And then that's their opportunity to mitigate what happened. This is what happened. This is why the game wasn't played uh, and so on. So um, my, just my recommendation is please follow the disciplinary process if you are charged for whatever reason. Um, we have had situations where clubs have been so ticked off that they were charged that they've just ignored it. And, and that, that doesn't work. That doesn't resolve the problem. Um, so hopefully we've answered that. But if anyone needs to come back to me for any further details um, or any just want to chat around particular cases or anything like that, where you're unsure if you did the right thing or you've got a game coming up this weekend and you're not sure we've got enough to play, but we don't want to play, it will be a league decision around there. So the league will fall back on that league rules um, as to whether a fixture needs to be fulfilled. Um, I'm just going to click back on to... Yeah. Just, just in the chat, there's been a number of things around um, test and trace, but as you've said in the presentation, you did actually cover that quite extensively last time. You're going to send last times. Yeah, I'll just pop up on that as well, that we have had situations... And I know in the last meeting we said that football is not considered close contact. So therefore, if a player tests positive or sorry, a player has signs and symptoms and they you get them out and they go home, not everyone has to self-isolate. That remains the case. However, test and trace supersedes everything, which we said last time. So if you are contacted by test and trace, you would have to self-isolate, even if your contact was only at football, which should be low risk if we're doing all the stuff we said. We have had situations where test and trace have overridden that and they have uh, requested that everyone participating um, in that team have to self-isolate. If that happens, you have to adhere to that. You have to follow what test and trace say. It's not every case, but I'm just making you aware that it has happened um, where they have said, right, we want names of everyone in that squad. Um, so it, it can happen. We're hoping it doesn't, but it can happen. Um, Nicholas, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, good evening. Thanks, Tom. Um, uh, the league, if you wish to cancel a game, uh, yeah. they're asking they're asking for proof uh, first and foremost. Um, it's it's not new to me, but um, I think it ought to be sort of stressed that uh, you can't actually divulge somebody's medical records, especially a minor. And when the league is asking for proof. I think that there should be some sort of leniency, acceptance. These are pressing times. Uh, there's more pressure than ever on volunteers and club secretaries, welfare officers and so forth. Yet the extensive pressure that they're receiving to get football going again, um, I think should be superseded by some sort of sympathetic view towards, you know, you, you can't go asking for a kid's medical records. Sorry. Anyway, and thank I you, Tom. Um, it was something we talked about in the last meeting. Um, Leon had his Leon's meeting pretty much weekly and um, with the leagues. Um, and like we said last time, we're really pushing for consistency, but we can't guarantee it's a county FA because, like we said, each league have their own sets of rules. Um, I do uh, I do have sympathy with what you're talking about the, the medical records. I think in some of the cases, all the they've almost said right, we want to see a copy of the letter if it's a school bubble closure or the email that went out. I know people, I've not had one, but I think people receive their positive test by text message, I think. Um, so I know in cases they've asked for that, but you are within your rights to say, actually, we're not willing to provide you that. However, we are telling you that player A, player B and player C have had their school bubble closed and therefore they're self-isolating. And actually, player D has tested positive. So therefore, we that is why we cannot play the fixture this weekend. It takes us under the threshold uh, of the players required. Um, I think, like I said, chances are if they tell you to play it, 
and you don't, you'll be charged. But again, include that in the mitigation as to what the situation was. We had four players score bubble close. We had three positive tests, leaving us with only X amount of players. This was the timeline. This is when we found out. This is when we reported it to the league um, and then let the disciplinary process flow out from there. Um, so I, I totally appreciate what you're saying and I totally appreciate we have to protect data and parents like do want to protect, particularly with minors, their data and they're well within the rights to say we're not sharing that information. But we are telling you that my our child has tested positive uh, for COVID. So I totally appreciate what you're saying there, Nicholas. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to, I can't see any more hands up. I'm just going to go back into the chat. It's kind of your last opportunity. Um, if anyone's got any burning questions, me and Claire will stay in until kind of it, it kind of quiets down. Um, but that is the end of the meeting. Hopefully it's been of some value to you. Um, thank you for joining us again. We'll look to get one probably uh, after Christmas now into the new year. Oh, sorry. I see that can I attend adult grassroots games. Yes, they can. Adults yeah, can stop, attend. That's come up a few adult times. Sorry. Games. Yeah. Yeah. She's asked the same question a few times. Do apologise. Right, I kept missing it. Yeah. They can attend um, adult grassroots games, as long as you do everything we said about 45 minutes ago. Um, so absolutely, adults can attend grassroots games. I know the guidance has changed for some of the top steps. They had their staged kind of getting spectators back in. So if you are in steps three to six, that is not the same guidance as grassroots football. And it's important to have that this uh, distinguish between the two. Um, for those of you still on, like we said, it will be after Christmas probably now. So stay safe during this time. Please get in touch with us if you're unsure of anything or you have any concerns about anything that's happening at your club, anything that's happened with opposition clubs, anything that's happening uh, within your leagues that you're unsure about. Please do get in touch with us and we'll do our absolute best to answer that. Um, so we'll stay on and I'll just have a hoover up now of any of those questions that I've missed. And get those DBS checks done. <laughs> <laughs> Will they show against? Oh, you've answered that. Using it, yes, yeah. I think considering we started at quarter two. Doing pretty well, Tom. I think we got through the, the press in 45. Yeah, very good. In fact, we did the presentation quicker than that. And you got to use your lovely diagram of the geographical area. That did you see that I grayed out the North Yorkshire bit? <laughs> After being questioned earlier on, uh, what's happening about welfare officer DBSs? Okay, uh, welfare officer DBS, uh, get in touch with me because you can do that through the county FA, and we we are doing verification at the county FA offices for welfare officers, referees, people who aren't can't do it through a club. Is it right that John Field can't? I'm signed for that one, Claire. Oh. Just typing away. In fact, why am I typing it? Uh, who wrote it? Simon, Tier 3, Uti Bridge, uh, and John Field. Is it right that John Field can't travel to South Yorkshire? It's not right that the club can't. It's right that the players cannot travel across borders. So, for example, if all of John Field's players lived in South Yorkshire, then they would be free to travel um, within our county. But players cannot go from South Yorkshire to Derbyshire and Dart and vice versa. So from Derbyshire to South Yorkshire. No adult can travel to play grassroots football um, across county borders like that. And I'll delete my answer. So Matt's saying, where can you find the info from the last meeting? Did you say you were going to send that I'll out? With this one? To everyone that signed up for the meeting, I will send that out. It will be tomorrow morning because you have to wait for the recording to save itself online and uh, and make itself available for me. So that, yeah, we'll send that out. There'll be a link to this, a link to that, and all the slides from both I will include. Claire, Mark's asked about uh, welfare officers, DBS there. I don't know if you've seen that one. Yeah, I've answered that one. Uh, it's okay. Let's hopefully, right, I'll keep an eye on this.
still 23 people in the meeting. Is there any more questions or... Um... People that, that switch, they must have got bored of my presenting. <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> Oh, it's going down. There we go. Oh, I'll, I'll stop recording. Stop recording.